Oh, like none of you have ever died before. I haven't. Yes, you have. You've died twice. Ah! Lockheed wants to know if we're counting alternate timelines? I don't think so. Well, I guess that means you haven't died. I haven't died either. At least not to the best of my recollection. I've died once, and he's died... Oh, I've lost count. Hello, evil villain enacting his plan over here. No, wait, I want to figure this I out. I was killed in Japan. Fine, I'll just kill all of you. I died in Hong Kong. Well, that would only serve to compound the conundrum I when we all come back. Thing before the oh my god, wait, has Lockheed died? <laughs> no one dies tonight. So says the Phoenix. Oh, for Christ's sake. Fastball special, now they're on the attack And the adamantium claws they go around his neck And the helmet saw All of a sudden they got Cyclops Optic blasting, now the juggernaut's lost Went out the woods, Saber 2 takes a chunk out of Wolverine's side We can't let it slide So we'll blow back by the wind that Storm concocted Right back into a fist from Colossus How? Now the blob drops out of the sky Hello and welcome to another episode with the Rollin' Twenties We are the show that knows that the greatest member G.I. Joe ever had was known as Fumbles I am Jeremy <laughs> And Jesse Remember, you can subscribe to us on Stitcher and on iTunes, as well as several other podcasts in the Mission Starts podcast library, where you can find convention reports and a lot of other going on in the geek world. Uh, you can subscribe to us on Twitter at Rolling Underscore Twenties. Uh, the music, once again, was by Adam Warhawk. You can find his stuff on AdamWarhawk.com, as well as find his albums on Amazon.com for purchase. How's the day treating you both? Uh, first day trying to get on day shift, so... Ooh, yeah. well, well, at least you're going to be in the same time zone as the rest of us now. Yeah. Although, there, I've got today off, I've got tomorrow off, but instead of just starting at 7 a.m., oh no, that would be too easy, so instead they're going to make me work a 12-hour day on my first day back and go in at 3 a.m. Oh, so we're just starting off in wonderful places. Oh, yes. Joy. Uh, let's see. Sorry, I got a little, <laughs> I got a little, uh, befuddled there, you know. I'm not gonna go into details, but I mean, my life is changing a bit, so. Gotta try and work all that out. And I'm in the middle of trying to prepare for, uh, frickin' Anime Expo, which I'm sure is just going to kick my ass in several respects. Yeah. But, uh, huh. But, you know, it's it's not terrible. Get through. Uh, yep. I'm trying to think of what else is going on. Oh, there's been recently word that porno graffiti is going to be at Axe, which is Sony Music, so it leads me to wonder if Sony Music is finally starting to feel at least a little something towards Anime Expo other than hatred. But, uh, yeah, in the, I got that email, too. Yeah, in the meantime, though, a little bit of good news. Due to the, uh, the interview I had with one of Sony Music's uh, entertainment, I now have a contact within their office who said that she's going to do her best to try and find me a little time for at least an email interview with the band, even though Axe denied me press. Hmm. Yeah. So, you know, what can I say? At least uh, they're considering us as real press instead of just brushing us off. Yeah, that's cool. But uh, other than that, you know, it's about the same. And you guys have probably already noticed out there that V isn't with us today. She has felt terrible for the last week. Uh, she apparently was at work sneezing hard enough that she nearly knocked herself out on her desk. Oh, hope she gets better. Yeah, so do I. That is not something I want to hear about, is a lady, you know, knocking herself out at a cubicle. <laughs> oh. I didn't mean to laugh, but yeah. Well, there's very few ways that can go down positively, let's put it that way. But, uh, let's see, show... We agreed uh, last time we met before Memorial Day that we're going to talk about the Green Lantern Rebirth. Uh, you guys both took time now to read it? Yep, yep. Okay, cool. Uh, before that, we'll get into the usual news. Uh, something I wanted to talk about in the last two to three weeks, but I forgot about. Have you guys heard about the uh, the weird pseudo-controversy about Disney and uh, making Merida from Brave their 11th official princess? Yeah, I heard... I heard. Okay, for those of you who aren't aware of this, uh, Disney did make the announcement that Merida is going to be the next official princess in their library, and uh, they decided to put out a redesigned version of the character, which had her in this 
you know, more princess-like gown, no bow, uh, detangled the curls in her hair a bit. And um, there was a, a pretty large backlash, uh, you know, stating that they stripped away everything from the character, she's not a warrior and all this stuff. And as I read it, I, I talked it over with my wife, and she and I came to the same conclusion. What in the blue hell is your problem? And when I say that, I don't mean Disney. Uh, you know, it's I don't understand why the character can't have a visual makeover, because as far as I can tell, even though it's a visual makeover, nobody ever said they were changing the character, in the least. Yeah, that and they have rights to the character. Yeah. I'm sorry, if you're disappointed or upset, that's your... <laughs> You know, nobody can tell you, no, you can't be upset. It is your choice. But well, at the same time, you know, it's their character. They can have full rights to wherever they want. With it. Yeah, I mean, I understand she's an archer and everything, but that doesn't mean she has the bow stapled to her hip every damn day. Last I checked, even Hawkeye loses his bow, and he's supposed to be pretty good with it. Oh, God, speaking of Hawkeye, that last little swim. <laughs> okay, don't... Oh, was bad. Okay, I'm not really sure what you're talking about. Um, um. Yeah, we're about chicken. We'll just leave it at that. Okay, but uh, you know, uh, Disney fans or Disney parents need to calm the frick down because the conversation I had with my wife was that just because this character had this visual makeover doesn't mean she's any less of a warrior, doesn't mean that she's any less fiery. However, if you've watched the movie, you understand that there is this possibility that she was going to make a shift to something a little more ladylike at the end. So, yeah. y you people are denying character growth. You want her to be Arrested Development 16, Ancient Scottish Forever. Y'all need to calm the frick down. You know, characters will grow up, characters will change. And, and a, some of this backlash even came from the main writer of the movie. Well, you kind of ran that risk when you sold the script. You know, if they paid money for it, they have rights to make certain changes to it. Yeah. So, she, her claim was that it insults her because she based it on her daughter. Well, she could have based it on a third party where she wouldn't feel so damn attached to it. So, again, calm the frick down. It's not like they're telling girls you have to be beautiful and pretty. The message I got was you can be beautiful, pretty, fierce, and a fighter. Yeah. I mean, let's be honest about this, too. I mean, it's not like... I mean, it is a Disney film. There was nobody really dying other than... Mom, the bear. bear. But, you know, it, yeah, she practices archery. She's an excellent shot, but she didn't really kill anything, so. Yeah. Yeah, uh, unfortunately, it's one of those things where people are so used to Disney raising their kids for them, they really don't want to take time to explain it. But, uh. uh I don't know. I, I, honestly, I think that's a better choice than, um, what's her name? Uh, from, uh... Oh, I enjoyed What's-Her-Name and That Thing way back when. Yeah, that was a great one. Yep, yep. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Wake it, obviously. But, <laughs> which is sad, because I've been up since seven. Um, <laughs> yeah, Wreck-It Ralph, thank you. Oh, okay. Yeah, well... Yeah. Uh, I think for some reason I was joking about Princess Leia possibly being it now, too, and... You know. Yeah, I, I I would stay far away from Disneyland during that particular coronation. I really don't want to see the sea of humanity and what would be produced. Uh, let's see. In the meantime, uh, a lot of pictures have come out from the set of uh, X-Men Days of Futures Past. Uh, they're mainly in-between pics. There's not many actual footage uh, images. But what has come out uh, so far, we put up on the website previous. Now there's a picture of Jennifer Lawrence uh, doing a test shot in the Mystique makeup. Uh, there's also a shot of, uh, Michael Fassbender and, uh, James McAvoy walking to the set, which is obviously a between pick since by this time Xavier does not have use of his legs. Mm -hmm. And, uh, there's also a picture of Peter Dinklage, and it appears his role has finally been announced for the movie. He is going to be Bolivar Trask by all indications. Yeah, That's right. I just saw that. Yeah. Uh... You know, I saw one response online who just said that a midget should not play Bolivar Trask, and I don't... Bolivar Trask was the guy who invented Sentinels, so I don't know what being four foot tall has to do with anything. Yeah. 
you know, when you're a genius, you're a genius. I mean, Tony Stark is, just, you know, was a skinny nightmare until he put on damn Iron Man suit. So that. Oh, one of the articles I read about that uh, mentioned that uh, Stanley, uh, Stanley and Jack Kirby, the inspiration for both our trusses original uh, image mm -hmm. was Walt Disney. <laughs> <laughs> wow, Nazi jokes everywhere on that one. <laughs> and uh, there was another image that kind of sealed the deal when they showed an extra walking through the craft services table. He's wearing one of those gray uh, maintenance jumpsuits, and on the back of it is a big purple logo that says Trask Industries. <laughs> so, looks like that one's pretty well sealed in stone at this point. Uh, the co-writer and producer of the latest Star Trek film, Into Darkness, he, uh, he felt a need to apologize to the women of America. Uh, the reason for, the reason for that was for Alice Eve's appearance in the movie in lingerie. I don't know, I'm so yeah, I see that I, or today, sometimes, so. Well, I just, yeah, well, that's up to you. Uh. He's just talking for now. Um, you know, this is another case where it seems like people may be overreacting a little bit because it's not like she was prancing nude through the film. And to be honest, I understand that this used to be a TV series. It's kind of all ages, but you're going to a movie theater. And that does tend to have, unless there's a talking dog in the film, a pretty, uh, a little bit higher of a uh, adult content in it. Yeah, I mean, let's look at the first film with, you know, the Green Lady. Yeah. Obli obligatory Green Lady? Yeah. Yeah. She definitely was not exactly a plot point. You know, she was definitely a show. Yeah. Uh, whatever. You know. I suppose I will get over it. Uh, n no, I, I think you'd want to get up on it. Yeah, that's that's entirely possible. You know, it, it's another case where people are being pretty oversensitive to what I see as a relatively minor issue. It's an action film. Uh, there have been half-naked girls in action films since you and I were, you know, little sprouts. Yeah. So, uh, people, people, people. Again, movies are not going to raise your kids for you. If you don't want them to see half-naked people, don't take them to movies that have a PG-13 rating. Uh, there are some images that have come out from the set of Thor The Dark World, including uh, pictures of Thor, Sif, and Malekith the Accused. So, uh, there was also a picture kind of seated among them of what appears to be the Winter Soldier from the other movie being produced right now. So, I'll make sure that the webmaster gets copies of those. Um, DC is really pushing Superman right now, not just because of the movie, but because this year is Superman's 75th anniversary. Oh. So, it's uh, it's one of those things where that is a long legacy. I would be more excited about it if uh, the Superman that's portrayed today was anywhere near the Superman that was introduced 75 years ago. Yeah. You know, uh, I mean, minus the power changes, he's been rebooted at least once, so it's not exactly the same cat. He hasn't made it 75 years, in my opinion. <laughs> Thank you. Apparently he's upset, too. Uh, in more movie news, uh, the Green Lantern sequel is going to be... Uh, or, I'm sorry, the Green Lantern writer, he's been picked to write the Blade Runner sequel. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it was a draft by uh, Hampton Francher, the original co-writer of the 1982 uh, sci-fi film with Ridley Scott. And this one is supposed to be set uh, some years after the original. They're not very clear on that. But, uh, yeah, I, I, I don't know if I'd exactly brag that the writer of the Green Lantern film is going to be rewriting my script. Yeah. And this could be problematic. Especially, uh, okay, they actually greenlit the sequel for that. Uh, apparently, they've they've had this in the can for a while, but they figure that now's the time to do it. I I don't know what changed. I mean, Harrison Ford is not exactly in shape to really do that role anymore, and the movie's going to be turned inside out compared to what it used to be. I'm sure. Effects in yeah. themselves have come so far along. 
So it's a curiosity. I, I don't know exactly where it's going. Um, I'm not even sure if I can say it's something I'm necessarily interested in. I know there are people that will go gaga for it, but it's just, I don't know. Yeah, I, I don't know. I, I think I've watched Blade Runner once. Yeah. All the way through. Well, to, uh, I guess it's kind of like Men in Black 3 to me. You know, you w waited so long to come out with a sequel. I'm sure a lot of people are saying, who asked for this? I, you know what? I, I had to agree more with the people that, you know, when they made the live-action Smurfs. <laughs> <laughs> what, which I also understand is getting a sequel. That apparently did quite well in the box office. Oh. Yeah. Uh, I was hoping uh, the fourth Transformers film was just a nightmare, but apparently that's going through. Oh, no, that's already in production. Uh, oh, I know. I've seen, I've seen all the vehicles. Yeah. Uh, they've redesigned Optimus Prime's vehicle mode, and uh, they've also redesigned Bumblebee as a kind of a custom 1970s Camaro instead this time. Uh, they've added a, a large military vehicle, a Bugatti Veyron, which is one of the most expensive vehicles on the planet, and a current Corvette Stingray concept. The odd part is is that I, I'm starting to get the feeling some of these are placeholder names. The military vehicle, they say, is going to be Hound, even though it resembles Bulkhead from like three different series right now. Yeah. Uh, the Bugatti Veyron, they say, is going to be Drift. And the Stingray concept... The name currently attached to it is Slingshot. Yep. So there's a whole bunch of curiosities to me in there as a Transformers fan. I'll, I'll probably see this because the redesigns have me very curious, but I'm not exactly going in expecting to see a movie I plan on buying later. I'll second that motion. <laughs> uh, the box art for the Deadpool game has finally come out. And on the box, there's Cable, Rogue, Domino, Psylocke, and Wolverine. I don't know. I just... Uh, I, uh, I don't know. Who knows? Yeah. I don't know. I mean, the game nearly sucked me in in the first promo where it ended with the phrase, Suck it, Wolverine. <laughs> but, uh... Well, uh Again, I think that's something I'll have to try out before I decide if I buy it. Uh, in more movie news, Glenn Close has apparently been cast in a role of Guardians of the Galaxy. Really? Yeah. Uh, she's an Oscar winner. Uh, she's a very high-regard person. The, the site says that she's supposed to play an unnamed major role in the film, but most of the speculation seems to, th seems to be that she will be cast in a leadership position in the Nova Corps. Huh. Which was... Okay, that kind of makes sense. Yeah, it was really kind of left field, though, because in the same week, they, there's a rumor saying that John C. Riley is also going to be attached to the film as Roman Day, a Nova Corps leader. So, it, 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 it adds a lot of curiosity as to why Nova was attached to this movie all of a sudden. Or maybe at all. Well, Nova was part of Guardians of the Galaxy, wasn't he? No, he was loosely, no. He was loosely affiliated with it, friends with their leader. Oh, okay. Hmm. Other than that, I think it was just generally kind of on his own. Largely. Uh, other than the other core members, but I guess the question is which version are we getting? Are we getting Richard Ryder, the hyper-powered one, or the closer to normal one, Sam Alexander? Who knows? Yeah. Well, that just means that the Guardians of the Galaxy could either be working alongside or were drafted by... I don't know. I so mean... Obviously, the Nova Corps is going to play some part in this movie. Yeah, and apparently John C. Riley, the one they want him to do is kind of... or the role they want him to take is the Agent Coulson of cosmic movies. So it could be that Roman Day is going to appear in several different uh, movies taking place in Marvel's version of space. But who knows? I mean, so far, a lot of the casting news has been heavy speculation. They're doing a good job keeping this one under wraps. They're still not... No one is still absolutely sure that Zoe Saldana is going to play uh, Gamora or if uh, Dave Bautista is going to be Drax. Chris Pratt, as the Star-Lord, is the only one everyone seems to be sure of. So, it's all speculation and smoke and mirrors right now. Mm -hmm. And uh, Joss Whedon still has not named the villain for Avengers 2, but he's apparently very excited about it. That's all he'll say. He's keeping this so far under wraps is kind of astonishing. 
Well, so he'll be excited for it, too. Well, he also said in an interview, he said he knows he will never make a moment as pleasing in a film as Hulk versus Loki. <laughs> That. Yeah, that's obviously a challenge. And uh, also, when he made an appearance on Jimmy Fallon, Joss Whedon talked about the Scarlet Witch and Quicksilver, which he did confirm are going to be in the movie. So, there's that. Finally, that rumor is at least laid to rest. And uh, also in Guardians of the Galaxy news, a Doctor Who companion has been cast in a role as the lead, uh, the lead female villain, apparently, which has been unnamed. Uh, the actress's name is Karen Gillian. She was known as the companion to Matt Smith's Doctor Who for several seasons. <laughs> My Doctor I don't think that's a secret. is severely lacking, so I don't know. Uh, yeah. Well, it, it, she's, a, she's a ginger, so I'm sure that means she'll be a soul-sucking vampire in the movie. <laughs> Gosh, apparently. Uh, well, we'll never know. We won't know for a while, though, because nobody has named the role. There's, they were surprised enough that she was suddenly cast. And uh, I should have mentioned that before the show, we use another clip from uh, X Men: Death Becomes Them. Uh, enjoy that. And uh, from there, we will move into our discussion. Uh, we decided to reach back a few years and read uh, Green Lantern Rebirth. Uh, it's kind of an interesting series because at this point in DC's history, pre-52, uh, or pre-New 52, I should say, Hal Jordan is dead and he has been uh, acting as the Spectre, which is a spirit of absolute vengeance in the DC universe, without a flaming motorcycle anyway. And uh, I think at this time there was only one active Green Lantern, and that was uh, that was the Kyle Rayner one. Yep. And a few events transpired that forced Hal Jordan back into the land of the living. Like, that's never happened in comic books, but I digress. Uh, what were you guys' opinions? Honestly, uh, good, strong storytelling. Uh, I love the art. Uh, okay. I liked it. Yeah, this was the beginning of Jeff Johns' uh, kind of rise to prominence in uh, DC writing. Uh, this was his first shot at taking a character who'd been kind of on the outs and, you know, bringing him to a level of prominence, which arguably, well, I don't think it's arguable. I think it worked because Hal Jordan was very highly featured in these series all the way up until, uh, all the way up and through the Sinestro Wars. Jesse, you're awfully quiet all of a sudden. I'm just trying to put my thoughts together. Give me a sec. Okay. Do you, you want a squeeze toy or something? <laughs> uh. Well, it's just, um, I think the art was done by Ivan Rice, if I remember correctly. Uh, he ended up teaming... Well, he ended up teaming up with, uh, with Jeff Johns for quite a while on Green Lantern, and he also was there when they introduced the, uh, the, the seven different cores of Ring Slingers. Mm -hmm. So his designs were really prominent. Uh, let's see. It was in this series that they uh, that they revealed that Parallax was not uh, Hal Jordan gone insane so much as uh, the living embodiment of fear that had possessed him. Um, that was one part of the story I was kind of iffy on because it's an awfully convenient way to turn around the actions he did in the last what fifteen years. Yeah, um, and of course, not being really familiar with DC history, I'm not sure if they had a precedent for it. But that's kind of always been the way that you know if you need to figure out how to you know undo some stuff, a la say Charles Xavier. <laughs> 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 well, I'm actually, like that. Definite <laughs> precedent for you know going back and rewriting some things. Well, it uh, I'd say it was Legion's better than Superboy's retcon punch. <laughs> True enough. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I mean, this was a very strange point in history when uh, Guy Gardner was. I guess he found out he was part alien and using some kind of weird bio armor. 
I, I, like actual shape shifting abilities or something like that. He, he literally formed weapons out of his body. Yeah, he, he definitely hulked up to a certain degree when that occurred. Um, but uh, you know the interactions early on, especially with uh, Hal Jordan as a Spectre and Green Arrow and uh, his Speedy at the time. That was a little freaky. Uh, this was also a series that brought Black Hand out of the minor leagues as a villain into the majors. Uh, prior to his becoming a Black Lantern, the Black Hand, his claim to fame was somehow cobbling together a device that allowed him to track Green Lantern rings and sap their energy. And I'm still a little unsure as to how he had this level of technical proficiency considering his family w was all morticians. It wasn't. It wasn't even a very interesting looking device. It was this weird little golden rod. It it kind of looked like he adapted a Swedish vibrator. <laughs> you can say whatever you want about it. This is just my opinion. Uh, yeah, I I don't know. That just that that particular phrase just brings to mind. Uh, oh, what the hell was that one? Oh, damn it, I can't think of movie names today. Okay. <laughs> and it's like Top Secret or something like that. <laughs> We're just batting a thousand this morning. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, but the, the, what they did to Hand in that series, I, I understand he was a B or actually kind of a D-level villain at this point. Nobody cared. But to turn his hand into coal and just let it fall away like that? That was brutal. Yeah, it was the movie Top Secret. <laughs> yeah. With, with the gigantic jackhammer with the fist on the end. Oh, the yeah. Okay. <laughs> that, that was, yeah. Anyway. Okay. <laughs> uh, you have to see the movie. Oh, God, you have to see the movie if you haven't seen it. I'll pass. <laughs> But the, Come on, it's got Val Kilmer in it. It's a really good movie, actually. It's a good farce. Yeah, it is. Yeah. Uh, but uh, over the course of the series, it's very weird how Jordan seems to be, for lack of a better word, haunting several people while every Earthbound Green Lantern is slowly going insane. Yeah. You know, the, the first issue definitely set this creepy tone, but it's... It was a good jump-in point for people who weren't very aware of the Green Lantern, because they did a good job of summarizing the history of uh, Hal Jordan, the Corps, and the various Earth Lanterns. Mm -hmm. Kind of how they all wound up becoming Earth Lanterns. Pretty much. Uh, it even in issue two, it summed up Hal Jordan's origin very quickly. Mm -hmm. But uh, this series did something else, in that prior to Rebirth, it did seem like anybody who put on one of the Lantern Rings could use them to some kind of limited degree. Um, by the end yeah. of the series, the Green Arrow tried to use it, and it showed just how difficult it could be to summon up enough willpower to get the damn thing to do anything. Yeah. But, uh, you know, it put gr this, uh, this series put Guy Gardner back in a lantern ring, which is arguably where he always should have been, and it brought up what they call an impurity, you know, the, the weakness to yellow that lanterns had forever. Which yeah, I, I do actually think that that was an interesting take on that. I mean, it never really made sense to me. Yes, you are perfectly... You know, or they even make a joke about it, where, you know, uh, how Jordan apparently got blinded by some mustard. You know, it, just, <laughs> it never made sense to me. It's like, yes, yellow, the most you know insidious weapon to ever, you know, foil Green Lantern. I know. If you grab that left turn sign and beat the shit out of him, he will never be able to stop you. <laughs> Pee on his hand and he's powerless. I guess we should be glad that DC never came up with a streamer, but then again, we're talking about the same company that came up with Snowflame. Yeah, well, you know, somebody goes in, hacks all the traffic lights, and turns them all yellow. Ha ha! Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this can go on for a while. DC's uh, harshest new villain, DeJanae's. <laughs> yeah, this could go for a while. spice. <laughs> Coast City is suddenly marauded by a man in a giant yellow bird suit. No, 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 we, ha we have to go, go uh, racist on this. We'll, we'll name him uh, Hot Mustard. <laughs> uh, actually, that'd be kind of fitting, considering for a while the Green Lantern had a uh, sidekick called Pie Face. 
God. Yeah, we're batting a thousand on this one, buddy. Oh my God. Yeah, pie hey, face. Have the beautiful yellow bug. Yeah. <laughs> But uh, yeah, he's he's hauling around in a yellow rickshaw. <laughs> okay, okay. I think we we need to slow down. We're starting to do wrong here. Um, the other thing this series brought back to uh, serious prominence is uh. Well, I'm sorry. I was going through the I was going through it page by page. I mean, the whole parallax thing we discussed is kind of a dicey way to undo years worth of some of the best villainy that DC had. I mean, when you have a hero turn himself inside out and just play Maraud, you generally have some really good storytelling. Yeah. But uh, to undo it by him being possessed by Parallax, which, by the way, was not the giant poo monster this time around, uh, it, 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 it looks kind of like a psychotic mantis, I guess. This kind of reminded me of a sea creature. Yeah. But the other thing that this brought back in a serious way was uh, Sinestro. Uh, when they brought him back, and the way they portrayed him, they still portrayed him as this giant-headed, you know, weaselly-looking guy. But they described him so well as this guy whose voice could make sons tremble. You remember that? Yeah. Or his voice sound like stars dying, something to that effect. And just the way they portrayed how his powers work, even though this yellow impurity was no longer functioning, they did make him seem damn near unstoppable. Mm. It was a real entertaining way to put it together. But uh, did you also notice how the artists in this miniseries, how all four of the Earthbound Lanterns, their powers seem to work differently at all times? Yes, I did love that. I did love that. They had a serious amount of personality. Uh, even just their flight animations and all the different variations of the lantern symbol mm -hmm. was unique. Yeah. Uh, it Man, this spent a while focusing on Parallax, though, and his, or its, uh, possession of different individuals. It uh, did get kind of tiresome after a little while. You know, I... I'm, st I'm not saying it wasn't a positive series. It, it actually made me read The Green Lantern for almost ten years after it came out. Mm -hmm. But there were a few things that came dangerously close to cliche rather early in. Well, I think, honestly, you know, when you're making something, you have to kind of deal with that. It, you're never going to be able to come, come up with uh, truly unique ideas all, all the time. True. Very true. Uh, it's one of those double-edged swords when you have massive amounts of uh, of history and continuity to go through, is you do have to keep certain things uniform until you find a good reason to make an adaption. Mm -hmm. uh, Parallax, unfortunately. Um, I don't know. It's one of those things where it helped bring the character back, but it was also a whole group of uh, a whole group of stereotypes. Oh, I'm sorry. The the artist is Ethan Van Scriver. Okay, Cyber. Yeah. But uh, it did start another trend that I was kind of glad to see through DC Comics, and that is finally some of the large things going on in their universe were no longer being solved by just the trio of Wonder Woman, Batman, and Superman. Other heroes were finally stepping up to the plate for once and solving something. Mm -hmm. I did like shooting Superman in the eyes with the power. <laughs> <laughs> That was a bold <laughs> statement right there. <laughs> I'm almost surprised it didn't come out like a, a Three Stooges style eye poke. Yeah, just... Yep, yep, yep. If it had been, if it had been uh, uh, the artist, it probably would have been. Or Hal. But being but, yeah. the engineer. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, yeah, Rainer, Rainer might have done the eye poke, but... Yeah, it's... It's one of those things where if you're a Green Lantern fan, Rebirth is really something you should pick up and read even today. 
Um, oh yeah. Given, I mean, even given the Fifty Two reboot, there's very little that I think has changed from that particular edge of uh, DC history. So it's still very in continuity. Uh, if you're not a uh, Green Lantern fan, you should probably still read it because it gives you a good amount of the history, very visual stunning, and uh, it does modify the characters to the point where they're a little more grounded. You know, they actually feel a little more like people instead of just places that house the spandex until they're ready. Yeah. Well, that and, you know, it does lead into, as you pointed out, one of the bigger story arcs. Yeah, the Sinestro War, I mean, it... The Sinestro War was very good to me, and by then, yeah, they had figured out how to undo the yellow impurity, so yellow was not a, a problem. But when you have a whole bunch of uh, of power ringers who have the ability to kill while you do not, you're already at a big disadvantage. At this point, the Green Lantern Ring still did not have the ability to, uh, to end someone's life. Mm. So... It's like the discussion we had uh, in the uh, the superhero psyche debate as to where do you draw the line. And right. it's one of those things where even some of those characters who wanted to do something about it really couldn't because they have this this limitation that was only taken away late, I think, late in their dealings with the Sinestro Corps. Yeah, that was actually, if I remember correctly, a Guardian decision. Yeah. But, uh, the, I mean, the current status of the Green Lantern, um, I stopped reading it as of the end of The Wrath of the First Lantern. I was starting to find it all very repetitive with everything being solved by Power Ringers. Uh, all of your enemies were Power Ringers. All your enemies knew about the emotional spectrum and how to manipulate it. Uh, I mean, they're just starting to get away from that now in future stories, but I've already made the decision to back off because I don't know... I don't want to get too invested in the new 52. I, I just haven't found a lot in there I like outside of uh, segments of the Green Lantern and, for the first time in my life, Aquaman. So I found Red Hood to be interesting up until the current story. Really? A lot of people kind of derided that one. Where, where did you find the interest in that? Uh, I was like the character interaction. They're down to earth and not... All that smart, to be honest. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, you've got the Red Hood and uh, the Red Arrow, which are kind of two of the more notorious meatheads in the DC universe. And then you have the uh, the awkward alien Starfire. princess. Starfire. Yeah. Double, double head. <laughs> yeah. Well, I was actually more interested in Roy Harper's deal because uh, he went to AA and got help from Killer Croc. Really? Yes. Killer Croc got him sober. <laughs> that's, uh, that's new? Yeah. I, I was I was quite amused when he pointed that out to me. Huh. I don't, man, I never tracked that. That's... Wow, okay. <laughs> I'm sorry, the last interaction I had with Killer Croc was the Arkham Asylum game, and I can't picture that guy going, you know what, you need to follow me. <laughs> You're out of... Well, I mean, he did beat the crap out of him. And then decided, no, you want to die, so I'm not going to do that. I know, but we're talking about getting him sober. We're talking about a guy who flosses his teeth with human ribs. Who suddenly said, "You're a mess, man." <laughs> yeah, very much. Yeah, I guess it would mean something. <laughs> <laughs> uh, You're so fucked up. I don't want to eat. <laughs> <laughs> you look gamey. Come on, let's put something on those bones. Oh my goodness. Yeah, I mean. <laughs> That's, I guess that's another thing that kind of turned me off from the New 52, is that even though they had a chance to bring these gods and goddesses down to a more relatable point, they still really haven't reached it. Or they haven't taken the opportunity to make these things at all closer to what a human being might feel. Mm. You know, they try a lot, but I just... I can't picture being a guy that has so little of a life that he sits in a cave every day, hour upon hour, plotting how to take down enemies that haven't made a move yet. I can't picture what it's like to be able to lift a bus simply because I can. You know, I can't picture what it's like to spend my entire life uh, training in Amazon war rituals. You know, all these little things that I would... I, I just can't... I don't have any footing in. This is probably why I read Marvel more often, because more often than not, these guys are fighting, so in the end of the day, they can all be people. Yeah. Right. Uh I can say for sure you probably won't like Red Hood only for the fact that they add a little bit of mysticism that makes his character somewhat more important. Even though this 
mystical training for us. And we're doing this because, well, we feel you, you're better off for this training than leaving you to your own devices. Well, I can't say that's altogether a bad thing, though, because even when they brought back uh, Jason Todd prior to the new 52, you know, the, the infamous retcon punch, um, he really didn't seem to have a whole lot of a purpose. He was just kind of a convenient villain or story uh, mixer idea to throw in when it was convenient. Um, in, the, in the New 52, at least he does have an actual purpose to the character still existing. Does that make sense? Yeah. Uh, I just... That's, a, that's the most important thing, is that sometimes in DC, uh, either New 52 or prior to, it seemed like a lot of their characters were almost as important as half the characters in X-Men The Last Stand. They just really don't know what to do with them at certain points. Uh, in the case of uh, in the case of the uh, outlaws in the Red Hood, they figured out something. Yeah, I mean, honestly, when you've been making you know characters and so forth uh, for so long, their characters just lose relevance sometimes until another writer comes in and says, "Hey, I've got a use for this guy." Yeah. So. Yeah, I mean, look at what happened to Emma Frost. How long was she irrelevant? Very, very true. <laughs> Honestly, the only thing I can say that the new 52 did was put everyone's character kind of in, in sync in a way, instead of having this random story for each character. Um, to a degree, although um, I don't know. I, I get the feeling that the new 52 isn't exactly new. It feels more like DC tried to copy Marvel, and instead of shifting their characters in that dis in that uh, direction, they just decided at one point, well, we'll flip a switch here and just say it's all. It's all done. Yeah, that could turn away a lot of people if you just don't do that right. Well, in my case, I mean, I I still tried it out, but it just it felt like it was a lot of the same characters with a couple new dialogues. And that's yeah. Well, my my continuing problem with it is you know even even with my limited knowledge, just how much they've decided to. Just kind of like, okay, well, we reset it, but we're just going to fast forward to the you know point where they were you know before we reset it, just so that people can find comfort in the fact that they're still the same superheroes that they you know recognized before, and we're not going to really give them anything new, but but we're just, they're, they're just going to rush to kind of get to that point. You, you know, so they, they, didn't, they didn't take the time to to do any real character exploration. You know a good way to sum that up now that now that you've said it out loud. It's not that they've changed their origins necessarily. It's not that they changed their powers necessarily. It's not even that they changed how they got their costumes, like the Flash and that bizarre costume in a ring thing. Really haven't changed that either. All they've really changed now that you've said it is that they've gone from dating X to dating Y. Have you noticed that? Yeah, they did change a lot of uh, character relationships. Yeah, Superman's not dating Lois Lane. Um, what is it? Uh, Barry Allen's not dating Iris West. That seems to be where the changes have come in. Instead of dating The Bachelor, they're dating The Bachelorette. Yeah, it just... I don't know. Uh, it just seemed like they were in a, a, a big rush to get back to the same place that they started from. And, and my whole thing with that is, if you're in that much of a rush, why do it in the first place? And it is, it's a question I don't think anyone can answer other than they got the chance to push out a whole bunch of new number ones and bump sales. Mm -hmm. There was a short period after the new 52 where DC was finally ruling the, uh, the comic book market for the first time in, I think, like 12 years. And now Marvel is... I don't want to say Marvel has followed suit, but after Avengers vs. X-Men, they came out with a bunch of new number ones, changed the status of their universe rather than changing it, and all of a sudden they're back on top of the lion's share. Yeah. And, you know, it is somewhat competition-driven, so, you know, obviously, you know, you've got to make the choices in that direction that you've got to make. So, you know, being that it had a positive result for them, you know, I can't really uh, fault them for, for taking that risk, but at the same time, I just don't like the direction it's headed at the moment. Yeah, Maybe that... they can do something different with it, but, you know, it, it seems like kind of after this, you know, newness, they, they just kind of said, well, 
we already saw what happened when we tried to give Superman new powers. And we've already seen what happened when we tried to change characters too much. You know, nobody likes it, so we're just going to hurry up and get back to that point so everybody's comfortable. Yeah, I mean, in the vein of changing, some people who are listening to this may mention the idea that Catwoman was recently shot through the head in Justice League of America number four. How, yeah, I saw that. How, <laughs> however, this is very transient because they've already established in the first few issues of the series that there is someone masquerading as Catwoman, stole her identity. So this could either A, be the fake, or B, the person that leads, or the person in charge of the Justice League of America, Amanda Waller, she's the same person in charge of the Suicide Squad, a bunch of people that she's already had to resurrect several times due to a serum they stole. So already people are pointing out that this death could be very transient and unimportant. Oh. Um. Yeah. So it, as, it seems like as quickly as they change status, it still flips back to the status quo. You know, I, I just, I hope they don't feel like they have to get to the point where we have another crisis every two to three years to revamp the universe again. It, it goes back to the argument we had when we first discussed the New 52. If you keep having to change the universe, then obviously your writers are doing something terrible. Yeah. Well, and then there's also the fact that so many of DC's writers are leaving. Leaving? Yeah. You know, um, I mean, that could be a difference in the... Uh, I don't think management has changed since the New 52. So, unfortunately, that could be a difference of opinion. Uh, like Steve mentioned, uh, the New 52 really hasn't changed that much since the reboot, other than a few time frames. So, when you have a bunch of writers who say, I've got X character and I've got a blank slate, suddenly he's got an overbearing suit behind him who says, well, you can't do this, 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 or this, you might be able to do that. Yeah. Oh, backseat driving, awesome. Basically, I mean, they're writers, but they still have to pass it through editors and editors in chief. Yeah, who may not get yeah, it through their head that, that these characters yeah. could be the reason why it's actually been in such a rush to get back to certain points because maybe it's not the writers, maybe it's actually the editors, editorial management, whatever that feel uncomfortable. There could also be kind of a duplicity going on there because DC has two editors in chief, whereas Marvel has one. Um, and unfortunately, one of them is one of my favorite artists, Jim Lee, who usually brings in a lot of interesting ideas. Don't always pan out like they ought to, but he at least tries. The other editor-in-chief is Dan Didio, a guy that a lot of DC purists blame for DC's stagnation because he's managed to keep a lot of things very similar, even through like five world-changing events he's overseen. So you basically got two guys sitting in one chair bringing new ideas and old ideas together, and none of them are meshing quite like you think. <laughs> yeah, that could just be yeah, a difference in uh, style, and that's how it's playing out. They're getting uh, conflicting uh, decision-making. Yeah. Which obviously would make it tough for people, especially since you're working on a deadline. Yeah. I mean, obviously, obviously, I'm not an artist or a writer, at least not a professional one. I'm, I'm like most people, I've done my deeds. But uh, it is unfortunate that these guys, instead of writing entirely what they want to, they have to answer to other people, which probably waters it down to the point where who knows what you're getting. <laughs> Something they submit could be turned inside out by the time it actually gets to the page. Oh, well. Let's just let's just hope something new comes out of it. Yeah. I mean, that's always the hope. I mean, whatever direction it's taking right now, hopefully they don't have to do a complete universe reboot, but, you know, they can still take things in different directions. Well, I think we'll find out whether or not that'll keep by the end of the Trinity War, where the Justice Leagues are going to fight each other. Let's see what comes out of that. Because mm. it's either going to be a major roster shift or it's a reboot. Those are the two things I expect. Assuming it's not together. But uh, I had an idea as to what to do next week, because I, I still want to talk superhero uh, sexuality. I think that'd be a fun conversation. But I want to hold that a little closer to Anime Expo, considering I'm sure that'll be A, a long talk, and B, we're going to be off again for another week. Uh, something just hit me, because we talk about Marvel and DC. We don't vary out into the independents very often. True. How would you guys like to talk about an independent I think we're fairly well versed in and something V would probably enjoy reading a whole lot? Adam Warren has a series of graphic novels under the name Empowered. Oh, God. I love oh. that series. 
Yeah, I'm sure that's some. I'm sure that's something that we were backing up our, our NAS and and switching it over. And I was like, oh, oh, I've actually got that on my computer. I was like, I was so happy. Well, that's. I think there's seven or eight volumes out now, and I'm sure that's something that the four people who listen to us have not had a chance to read yet. So I think that would be a fun show on something that a lot of people would be very unfamiliar on. Yeah. Yeah, and that does need to get more recognition. It would be interesting to find actually read that series. Oh, uh, it's, it's excellent. It is... Oh, no, no, I've heard you guys talk about it. <laughs> I have read it myself. Uh, so, next week? Okay, how um, do you want to do what, the first volume, or...? Mm, first volume is not really where it changed into what it is. Say the first, uh... Let's do the first three. Okay. <laughs> I think I think I've got up to volume four here. Uh, I think there's seven volumes out total right now. Right, but if we are only gonna do the first three, that should be doable well, without having to go do some purchasing. Yeah. So yeah, we'll say the first three. Oh, this is gonna be enjoyable. You, uh, you people, next week are in for a treat. <laughs> oh, the man that made the dirty pair. At least in the U.S., anyway. True. Yeah. All right. I think we're going to call it there. I invite you guys to roll with us again next week where we are talking the independent graphic novel Empowered. Uh, I hope to see you guys again, and hopefully stars will change for a few of us relatively soon. I am Jeremy. Steve. And Jesse. Thank you very much. You know what nation's only good as its citizens. And if this is the kind of world we're living in. See us declare a sovereign state You know a nation's only